Welcome everyone to today's event. I am Sean Lawson. I'm the director of the Communication Institute, and we are sponsoring today's event in which we have Nate Carlisle from Fox 13 and Sarah uh, Chinturova, uh, who is coming to us live from Slovakia. And we're going to be talking about human rights reporting and talking about Sarah's experience reporting from the war in Ukraine. So I'm going to go ahead and get off of here. Uh, I will be back at the end to help uh, facilitate the question and answer, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nate now, who is going to provide a more complete uh, introduction of Sarah, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Sarah to talk about her experience, and I will we'll see you all at the end. So Nate, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Sean. Hello, and on behalf of the Department of Communication and the Communication Institute at the University of Utah, welcome to Human Rights Journalism, reporting from Ukraine with journalist Sarah Chintrova. I'm your MC, Nate Carlisle, a reporter at Fox 13 Utah. I also teach the investigative reporting class at the University of Utah. Over the next 30 to 40 minutes, Sarah will tell us about her reporting in Ukraine before the war and upon its outbreak. Then she'll take questions from the audience. We especially would like to hear from students who might want to be foreign reporters one day. First, a little bit about Sarah. She is from the Slovakian capital of Bratislava. I hope I pronounced that okay, correctly. Uh, she had no formal training as a journalist when she began covering refugee crises in the Middle East and Europe a few years ago. I met her virtually last year through an exchange operated by the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy. The exchange paired foreign reporters with journalists from Utah. I provided her with some training on how to investigate government. I've joked with Sarah that she's done her career backwards. Most journalists start out examining municipal budgets and then wind up covering international conflicts, such as riding on a ship rescuing refugees in the Mediterranean Sea. Sarah has reversed that order. And with that, let's go ahead and take it over to Sarah. <laughs> thank you, Nate, and thank you for, <laughs> for the introduction that <laughs> made me laugh. <laughs> Um, and thank you all for, uh, for joining me today as, as I will speak about um, uh, my work experience reporting from Ukraine and particularly about my last reporting trip um, that took place um, that initially, um, you know, started on the 23rd of, of February 2022 when we all know what, what happened on the 24th in the morning and I was there amid the, this, you know, incredible tragedy and I witnessed the outbreak of the war and, and I myself eventually had to flee the country with, with, you know, millions of refugees because I myself was also struggling for my own um, survival. So I will share my presentation with, with some pictures um, from my last reporting trip and I'll, I'll talk you through this um, um, incredible experience. So I will um, share my screen now. Um, I hope it works. Um, Nate, can you just tell me if, if you can see the... Yeah, I, I see it on screen, Sarah. Um, also having a little trouble hearing you, if you can speak up a little bit or pull your microphone closer or something like that, please. Okay. Okay, is this, is this better now? Can, is, is it working? Yes, that's much better, Sarah. Okay, right. So, um, so this is um, so this is uh, the picture you are seeing right now is is a picture that um, is 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 very special for me. So, um, essentially, I'm a, I'm a human rights journalist, and as Nate said, uh, I'm I'm originally from Slovakia, and I've, I've lived and worked around the world. But uh, I'm now based in in Bratislava, in 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 you know, in my hometown, and um, I've I've covered the Ukraine conflict. I've been covering it ever since since its outbreak in 2014, from from many different um, locations across the country, from both Kiev and later on from from the eastern part of Ukraine, and also uh, I, you know I've also done a lot of reporting from the western parts of Ukraine reporting on the uh, immense um, um, IDP crisis, the crisis of you know, refugees and internally displaced persons um, as they were fleeing the war as of 2014. Later on, I started covering the, the front line, 
Um, so oftentimes, you know, people would say that, you know, that this used to be a frozen conflict. However, there, there always used to be some sporadic fighting, even, you know, prior to 2021 and 2022. Um, I've visited the front lines many times. Um, I was um, either, you know, working alone as a freelancer um, and because I speak Russian, I was fixing, you know, the, these trips for myself. But I was also embedded with different NGOs and, you know, and, and I've seen a lot of humanitarian kind of projects that have been implemented on, on the front line. And I've had the immense, um, you know, pleasure and honor to, to interview the local populations. And so this is, this is a picture that was taken in August 2021. And this is me interviewing this old lady, the, this Babushka Lydia, um, who was um, 85 years old at the time. And this this picture is really special for me because this lady, um, I don't know if she's still alive, but this lady lives or used to live in in, in a house that had been completely destroyed in 2014. Um, and she she lived um, in this frontline village um, at the very end of the village. So essentially, um, in a place where the contact line was dividing the separatist region uh, regions from. The government-controlled area, um, and so she was. She she would witness, um, you know, shootings, and she would hear shelling um, on a regular basis. And her house had been destroyed, and she was essentially surrounded by snipers and landmines. Yet, like many other people in eastern Ukraine, she did not want to leave. She said, "This is my house, and you know, and I want to. I, I was born here, and I want to die here, and I want to die in my bed." And she never fled. She hasn't fled after 2014 and she never wanted to flee the country, even after the military buildup kind of started, started happening in Ukraine in 2021 and early 2022. And I've completely lost touch with her. I don't know what, what, what happened to her after February 24th. Um, I think of her um, and many other people that I had interviewed incredibly resilient populations, incredibly kind people um, that are now, um, you know, suffering the consequences of, of you know, of, of this tragedy, essentially. And so these are just um, some, um, uh, some screenshots of, of some of the stories that I've been working on in recent months. So this is a story I did on the 2nd of February uh, from the front line for, for Al Jazeera English. So this is a story I did um, about elderly um, persons. Um, so um, before the war, before the 24th of February, before the war broke out the second time in Ukraine, um, the, uh, the front line populations um, um, were essentially constituted of of you know people who could not flee or didn't want to flee and many of them were elderly people and many of them actually unfortunately remember the world war ii and they would say things like i was born in, in a war and i will die in war and um and um i've been covering um some of these stories for for, for outlets like al jazeera um this is another screenshot uh this is another story i did uh on on 17th of february for foreign policy so this was a, a story about um, children uh, living on the front line who oftentimes, um, you know, had to live in, in terrible conditions and suffered from panic attacks. And, um, and this story was actually published on 17th of February, only a few hours after a, uh, a, a preschool, a kindergarten was hit by shells in Stanitsa Luhanska. Um, in eastern Ukraine, uh, which was, you know, one of the first kind of big incidents that started unfolding in, 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 in eastern Ukraine in February. And that was followed by the outbreak of the war on the 20th. And so this is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, the, the first picture that kind of, um, documents my, my last reporting trip, um, to eastern Ukraine. 
And for, <laughs> for, for all the people who are watching this presentation and who might want to become foreign reporters, um, I, um, you know, I, I just like to say a short kind of disclaimer. I mean, I, I love my job and it's amazing to be a foreign correspondent, but sometimes think and things can, can really go wrong. And so please don't think that all reporting trips, <laughs> you know, end up being so difficult, but this particular reporting trip um, very quickly turned into, um, I think, probably the most difficult reporting trip I've, I've ever done. So I was in Kiev um, as of February 23rd, and I was heading to eastern Ukraine to continue documenting the humanitarian crisis, crisis and the suffering on the front line. Um, I was traveling to eastern Ukraine by a night train. So this is a this is a picture of the night train, so that you can um, <laughs> kind of um, a picture the the you know the conditions and and the the, the way I traveled um, through through Ukraine to get to the east. Um, I was heading toward the east, even though I knew it was very dangerous. But I was committed to keep reporting on on civilians and on the humanitarian crisis. And I was invited to the eastern part of Ukraine to, um, to be a, a journalist on a press trip organized by the United Nations, by the UN, um, who had organized a two-day um, day, um, press trip for me. Um, and he was supposed to pick me up at 8.36. Uh, so I boarded the train on, on the night of the 23rd and I was supposed to arrive in, in a town called Kramatorsk in the east at 8.36 on the 24th of February. Um, the night uh, was, I mean, the night was very calm. When I was boarding the train, I, I rang the UN, I rang both the uh, Kiev office and the office in Kramatorsk and they uh, all said to me that there were no security updates um, so far and that everything looked good. So, um, you know, they promised to pick me up in front of my carriage when I arrived. And so I boarded the train and I actually spoke to people on the train. And then, you know, I've had this amazing um, uh, experience. Um, this is me uh, lying on the on the top bunk of, of the uh, night train. And I was really enjoying it because this is, you know, this is part of... Um, I guess of being a foreign correspondent and, and you know of, of reporting and, and traveling across foreign countries. So I was on the top bunk of, of the night train and I actually fell asleep for a few hours. And um, at around five o'clock in the morning, I woke up um, and I could clearly see that uh, you know something was wrong. Um, it was not full blown panic like I would see a couple of hours later. Um, but it was it was clear that there was something wrong. People were very nervous. People were, you know, kind of running around the train and, and talking about a war and talking. And I, I, I woke up. I was still on the, you know, on the top bunk of the, of the train. So I, I couldn't even move. And I just I just looked at my phone and I've seen dozens of messages um, from uh, from journalists, from editors, from from um, from a friend of mine who was also in Ukraine, he's a journalist, and he messaged me and he said, look, there's fighting going on all across eastern Ukraine, um, in Kharkiv, in, in Kramatorsk, where I was heading to, in Slavyansk. Be very, very careful. And then shortly thereafter, around five o'clock in the morning, I received um, a WhatsApp message from the press officer who was supposed to pick me up um, with a UN driver who sent me a WhatsApp message saying, hi, Sarah, please be advised that our trip has been suspended. And I wrote back and I said, um, you will still pick me up, right? And he never replied. So um, I, uh, at that point, the train was still heading east. So it was a very difficult situation. I called the press officer back uh, and I said to him, look, you know, I'm alone. I, I, given that the press trip was, and even the hotel and the accommodation was kind of arranged by them. I said, look, I, you know, I, I, I would need someone to pick me up. And the press officer said, um, look, we've received an order to stay put. We cannot um, pick you up. Uh, so it's up to you what you want to do next. And so at that point, I kind of realized that I was completely on my own. 
I didn't have a bulletproof vest because I was um, actually expecting that they would give me a bulletproof vest um, upon my arrival as I, I would be traveling with the UN vehicle. Um, the press officer said that they would not pick me up. And at, at that moment, I, I think the only thing that kind of ultimately saved my life was the fact that I'm fluent in Russian and I can read Cyrillic and that I was familiar with the country. Um, the signal was very poor on the train. I looked at the the list of the the stations where the train was supposed to be stopping at. The train was stopping in a small town called Lozova in, in kind of south of Kharkiv, so in eastern Ukraine, but not yet directly at the contact line. And I asked the press officer, I said to him, look, I'm in this small town. It's pro probably not a strategic place. Would you advise me to get off here and head back to Kiev? Because I, I don't see why I should ha head further east when hostilities are going on all around the region. And he said, look, it's a, it is up to you, but you are probably in a town that is not strategic, that probably won't be attacked just yet. So maybe it makes sense for you to get off there. So um, so I decided to get off the train. Uh, there was this elderly lady with me. And this was the difficult thing was that everyone on the train was traveling somewhere. People said, we want to go back to so, so and so because we want to spend you know, war with our families. We, we want to go back to our hometown, to our village. And, and me and this elderly lady who was just traveling to the separatist region to pick up her pension and she was going back to Kiev to live with her daughter. Me and her were, were the only two people on that train that, that were not heading anywhere. So we got off the train in this small town called Lozova and we asked the train attendant if, um, the, the, sorry, the, the train station um, attendant, when would the next um, train to Kiev uh, be? And the, the person at the train station said, um, you would have to wait for more than 12 hours. This was at five o'clock in the morning and the, the, the next train to heading to Kiev would, be, would come um, at around six or 7 p.m. And at that point, it was it was it was very tough because the station, the train station in, in this small town, had no underground shelter. And uh, the person who was working at the at the train station said said to me and to to this elderly lady, she said, "Look, if you want to go back to Kiev, there is this uh, small train heading to Kharkiv, leaving in ten minutes." Um, if I were you, I would take this train for Kharkiv and then take the first train back to Kiev. Kharkiv is Ukraine's second biggest town. So there's many trains heading back west. Um, it's going to be much quicker than to wait here for 12 hours. Um, so I decided to take the small train to Kharkiv, partly because I thought, um, you know, it, it was a much bigger city and there might be some NGOs or journalists um, or, you know, people who might be able to support me. And so this is the small train heading toward Kharkiv. Um, so this was um, this was um, in the morning of, of February 24th. Um, and I remember the man that you can see in the picture um, that was sitting in front of me, he didn't have a smartphone. He was just, you know, traveling from this small town to Kharkiv. And the train attendant who came to check um, our train tickets, um, you know, this man asked the train attendant, he said, what's going on? Why is everyone panicking? And the train attendant said, uh, well, it's, it's war. The war has begun. And so um, I was very, very lucky to arrive in Kharkiv, even though it was a very difficult choice, because at that point we knew that Kharkiv would be one of the first places to, to be attacked. But I was still very, very lucky that I was able to arrive there because I, I think I would have had no chance. It would have, would have been very difficult in a small, in a small town with, you know, with, with no one around to, to help me. So this is the train station in Kharkiv. Um, I arrived there about 10 o'clock in the morning. And so this is the, the, the line and the people um, queuing to buy, uh, to obtain information and to buy uh, train tickets for the train to Kiev. Um, at that moment, um, the Kharkiv train station was full of people, people who came, you know, with their suitcases, with their pets, with their cats and their dogs and entire families, just, just wanting to get out of eastern Ukraine. 
and I've overheard a young man saying, you know, I don't know where I'm going to go, but, you know, I need to get out of eastern Ukraine. I need to survive first and then I'll see if I want to go to Europe or somewhere else. Um, so this was only a few hours into the invasion. Um, and at that point, um, because I'm a journalist, um, <laughs> rather than um, caring for my own security, I, I, I continued reporting. So I should say that I'm a freelance journalist. I didn't have any contract sign, which I think, you know, is a mistake. And it's something I should have, um, I should have prepared. Of course, nobody knew how, you know, how, how um, quickly things would unfold. But at that time, I was uh, freelancing for Al Jazeera. So um, I was doing some stories and live videos. This is an attempt to do a live video. This is me reporting from the train station. Um, Al Jazeera English would later tell me that um, they could not work with me anymore because um, Kharkiv um, and essentially the places I was reporting from became too dangerous. And they said to me that they could not uh, work with me until I'm in a safer place and send them a risk assessment. So, um, so even though I was I was kind of freelancing for them, uh, they would um, they would tell me. Um, the following morning that I could not um, continue um, and um, deleted me from from the um, from the from the live um, reporter groups, which which was very, very difficult for me as a journalist. But again, you know, <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's it's um, it's a lesson learned. And I would just advise, you know, anyone who wants to be a foreign reporter to make sure you have contracts and make sure you have all the contingency plans and security plans in, in place with news organizations um, and other organizations. And uh, maybe I will also just say at this point that the UN uh, did not evacuate me either. Um, so um, in spite uh, the fact that I was supposed to travel on, on a field trip that they covered and where they, they arranged accommodation, I've never heard back from them. So I was at this point, I was completely uh, alone um, and without without a bulletproof vest in you know in in one of the worst war zones in the world, which was which was very difficult. But I decided I, I you know I'm a journalist and I want to I'm very determined and I want to keep reporting. So I was doing videos and interviewing people and doing live streams and and writing stories for for as long as I could. And so this is me waiting in in a line of people. Um, you know, waiting to buy a uh, train ticket for a train to Kiev that actually never came. Uh, and this is uh, this is the platform where people were waiting for the train. And I went onto the platform and I actually was interviewing people um, um, to um, at that time was for for Al Jazeera's live live blog to um, to see what you know what they had to say and and you know document how they were fleeing. Um, this is one of the last interviews I did, and I think it never got published. Um, these are uh, three men, um, two of them uh, from Algeria and one from Libya, who came to Ukraine um, to study, and then they stayed in Ukraine to work. Um, two of them spoke French, and I speak French too, so they were very happy and um, um and they they gladly gave me an interview and they even offered that I could kind of stay with them if I wanted to catch. They also wanted to catch a train to Kiev, which was very nice because it's true that I was also alone and I was trying to find <laughs> any contacts or any people that could also, you know, go through this experience with me so that I don't have to be all alone, you know, in, in the train or on the train station. Um and I often think about these three men and and what um, you know what has happened to them since, um, because um, you know the mess and the chaos and the panic at the train station, um, you know, became kind of more and more um, urgent, and uh, I've lost contact with them afterwards. But this is one of the last interviews and last pictures I've taken of people fleeing from Kharkiv. And so at one point, um, the uh, the option of going back to Kiev kind of looked like it would not be a possibility anymore. Um, 
I was um, at that point I was alone at the train station and I was looking for bomb shelters and looking, you know, to hide in the metro. At that point, um, we could not hear shelling at the train station, but it was clear that, you know, an imminent attack was about to take place. Um, I um, I uh, I received a I received a few phone calls from journalism organizations that were supporting me and that really saved my life, such as Reporters Without Borders and Committee to Protect Journalists and Rory Pick Trust. And I would really like to thank thank these organizations for their support because it is true that in these moments I was, you know, I was a freelancer and I was among the civilians uh, without equipment. Um, and at one point, um, I was advised to 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 go to a hotel where uh, where some uh, international um, news outlets had some presence that was um, that was uh, about fifty minutes away. Um, so my plan was to uh, to walk to the hotel and try and meet some other foreign journalists and some other foreign organizations um, that were supposed to uh, to be staying at the hotel. Um, and I wanted to get to this hotel um, by the me by metro. I actually um, got down um, to the to the underground to the metro, and and I was just trying to make sense of where I was going to go and how I was going to get to this hotel that was you know supposed to be one of the the safest places in Kharkiv at that moment. And I could not find, you know, my way in, in the metro. I was very confused and, and panicking at that time. And I always remember there was this young girl who kind of took pity on me and she showed me her, her phone and she said, look, take a picture of the Kharkiv metro on my phone. That way you will know where you have to go when, when you try to get to your hotel. And um, and my hands were shaking so much that I couldn't take the picture. So this is the this is the picture I've taken. But I'll forever be grateful to this woman for trying to help me, even as um, you know, Kharkiv was kind of plunging into more and more chaos. Um, when I was in the metro, the metro actually stopped working. Um, the lights went dim, and there was a public announcement saying there will be no no more metro until further notice and at that point you know it was becoming clear that there would be no metro and no trains back and we also knew that there was shelling going on in Kiev and in other cities um, so for me really um, the only option was to get into into this big hotel and try and see if I can meet other other journalists I had to um, walk to the hotel so this is one of the, the the pictures that I had taken in Kharkiv. So this was in the afternoon of the, of the 24th of February. Um, and I had to walk alone um, in Kharkiv for about an hour. Um, and the streets were completely empty. Um, the only thing that was open at that point was a supermarket. And I saw people um, buying uh, food and, and water and supplies in, in huge quantities. Um, as to you know survive the war but other than that it was it was um it, it was a horror movie experience the city was completely calm uh, we could hear explosions from from afar um, at that point there was no fighting within the city but it was still a very tough experience I walked to this uh, hotel where I had spent the night and where I've met um, some other foreign crews that were still um, at the hotel at that time um and um and i spent one night in the hotel um it was it was very very tough because at that moment we knew that there would be an imminent attack on kharkiv and my only thought was that i need to get to a safer place uh, first of all to save my life and second of all to continue reporting um luckily nothing bad happened in the night. Um, the, the Battle of Kharkiv started within the city um, the next morning. So this is this is a picture I took um, in the morning of the 25th of February. So this is a picture of a, um, of a car park that was like a make, makeshift um, bomb shelter close to the hotel. And this is a mother and her child 
uh, with their suitcase kind of running um, inside the car park as we could um, hear uh, fighting within the city. Um, and um, at that moment, I was not collaborating with any news outlets anymore. And this has been a very tough experience because I was just thinking about the fact that I'm now a civilian. Um, and um, it's it's been one of the toughest moments, I think, of my journalism career. But later on, I decided I would stay and report, even though I'm a freelancer, that I would continue to pitch stories and, you know, do not give up on reporting. Um, and I continued posting posts on Twitter and and then writing for for many other outlets um, as I as I travelled out of Ukraine. Um, during the, the these these very difficult moments when I was hiding in the uh, in the uh, bomb shelter, I received a phone call from the Committee to Protect Journalists that saved my life um, that informed me that there, there was a um, you know, one of one of the the contacts of this organization was uh, making a, making their way out of Kharkiv, and they had a spare seat on their car, in their car, and they drove me out of Kharkiv all the way to Lviv in in western Ukraine. So I spent the next forty eight hours in a car. Um, I think I was actually one of the you know rare reporters who managed to see the outbreak of the war and then cross the country within the two days that followed, which has been an incredible um, experience. And I, I recounted some of it um, in a story I did for, for the cut for the New York magazine, um, because um, as I was traveling out by car, um, you know, wherever we'd stop, we would see hundreds of thousands of des desperate refugees fleeing, um, you know, and, and, it, it was an incredible experience because everything had happened so quickly within only a few hours, you know, less than 48 hours into the invasion. There were already hundreds of thousands of people fleeing the country. There was not enough um, fuel, not enough gasoline. You know, there was a massive kind of traffic jam everywhere. It was impossible to find a hotel or a place to sleep and everything was just, you know, jammed with refugees and, and you know these people were, were were fleeing the country in a state of, of of pure horror and shock. You know they just they just you know took their suitcases and ran away. And whenever I'd interview refugees in in these two days following the invasion, I would ask them, you know, where are you heading to? And they would say, I don't know. And I would say, Are you going to Europe? And people would say, I don't know. And and I would say, What's your plan? And they would say, I don't know. It was just just pure panic and desperation, which only goes to show how bad and you know how horrendous this you know the, the violence of this war really was. And so two days later, I uh, I safely arrived in in Lviv in, in in western Ukraine. At that time, there had been no attacks in Lviv, um, so it was still considered as one of the you know sa safest or safer places within Ukraine. Um, I spent one night in Lviv where I, again, I saw dozens of desperate refugees queuing in front of hotels and, and hostels and, and looking for accommodation. And I decided to, um, to go back to Slovakia, uh, to, um, to have a, to, to take a break essentially after what I've been through. And, I um I was looking for uh, for people who could drive me to to my own home country to the Slovak border, and um, I found two refugees um, in their late twenties, Dima and Victoria, who were uh, who kindly offered um, that they would drive me to Slovakia in their car. So this is a picture uh, from the car uh, taken in, in during the night. So. Um, this was a specific reporting trip on its own because we spent four days in the car queuing at the Slovak border. So, um, so we essentially lived in the car for, for four days and, um, and in the, in the night, you know, people would fall asleep and then the cars would move and then we would all fall asleep again. And then one car would move and we would all like move and, and, um, and, and this went on for, for so many hours that we completely lost track of time. Um, and as you can see, um, this is, uh, Victoria in the back seat and, uh, we had a cat, we had a kitten that, uh, Dima and Victoria 
took with them as they were fleeing. And I actually did a story from the car for, for Der Spiegel in, in, in German um, about this, this incredible, you know, experience of, of fleeing the country um, and um, just waiting at the border. Um, and um, it's been very, very tough as well because um, uh, Dima and uh, Victoria, well, Dima, essentially the refugee who was driving, uh, originally comes from Kharkiv as well. And we, we actually spent four days, you know, watching news and looking at telegram channels. And Lima, who's from Kharkiv, was just watching his city get, you know, entirely destroyed by the war. And, and, you know, we would, we would just, just sit in the car and, and watch the news. And then Lima would say to me, look, this is my flat that was just destroyed. Look, this is my school. This is, you know, this is the university. This is the shop. And we would just watch the city get completely destroyed. And, you know, for me, I just got out of Kharkiv. So I was just grateful to be alive. And I could not imagine what Dima must have, you know, gone through, such as, you know, similarly to thousands of other Ukrainian refugees who, who managed to flee, but who now, you know, watch their home cities getting completely destroyed. Um, and so this is Victoria sleeping in the car with, with the kitten. And I have to say, we were very lucky to have the kitten because I think it was the only kind of joyful and uh, nice thing that we had to kind of cheer us up um, after this long, long journey. And these are some pictures from, uh, from the, uh, the trip back. So um, as you all know, there's so many women and children fleeing uh, the country. I think right now the most recent number is that 2 million children uh, fled. Um, and some of the volunteers on the Ukrainian side um, kind of volunteered not only to give food and water to the people queuing, but also to entertain children. So these are Ukrainian volunteers dressed, you know, in, in, in colorful costumes and dressed as clowns and cartoon characters. And they would walk from one car to another and play with, play with, you know, children who were stuck in the line. And this is another group of Ukrainian uh, volunteers who, uh, who were distributing um, food and water. And I felt, I felt very silly. It was, a, it was a tough choice, but at one point I was just so hungry and I realized I didn't, you know, eat for a week. And I thought it's silly because I'm not a refugee myself, but I'm just going to ask them for a piece of bread. And, you know, and ultimately as a human being, I just think, you know, that, um, this kind of experience just kind of, you know, brought me, you know, closer to the people that I report on. And, um, and I decided to keep reporting and to just, you know, um, keep the empathy and, and, you know, and, and keep this experience and, and kind of use it in a way, um, so that it can help me bring even, even stronger, you know, human stories. And uh, I'm still freelancing, although I'm, I'm really considering, you know, um, looking for somebody um, because I think looking for, for a company to hire me, because I think at one point stories like these are in increasingly difficult for freelancers. And, and I think nobody wants to end up and, you know, wind up in a situation similar to what I have to go through. Um, but I decided that I would, you know, keep reporting and just use this experience um, to uh, to bring stories that are more humane and 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 more knowledgeable. And um, and so this is one of the last pictures that I have taken. We've crossed the Slovak border in um, early March. At that point, I I couldn't even tell what time it was and what, what day it was and. And um, and then I arrived in, in back in Bratislava. Um, I think it was the third of March or something like that. And I continued writing about my experiences. And I'm currently reporting on um, on um, harassment and um, forced labor of Ukrainian refugees um, in Slovakia. Um, and I think there are so many stories related to the refugee crisis that really need to be reported on. So I decided to keep reporting and um, that is, I think, the end of my presentation. And uh, this is just uh, a few links to my websites and uh, to my website and my Twitter account.
Over to you, David. Okay. All right. Well, Sarah, thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, a few things before we get rolling here. Again, if you have questions for Sarah, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll read them to her and read them aloud. Um, also in the chat, I put a, a, a Google map with just a little bit of the geography involved just to help people understand uh, the distance uh, traveled and, and all that sort of thing. Um, Sarah, while we kind of wait for questions to roll in here, um, I'll pose one. You you talked about going into uh, Ukraine without a contract and can in how that was a mistake. Can you explain that a little more? I mean, what would have been, make sure I understand, the benefit of a contract would have been th that point Al Jazeera would have had an obligation to you and to help you exit the country. Is that what you're getting at? Well, you know, um, I, I mean, I have to say, um, you know, I'm, I was completely freelance, so I have no kind of, um, you know, document in, in writing with Al Jazeera or with any other outlet that I was working for. But I think right now, you know, if I had to go back to Ukraine, I would make sure I would have a contract with the media organization that would have to, um, uh, that would have to be responsible, you know, for my safety and for helping me. Um, uh, you know, particularly in a, in a hostile environment like, like Ukraine, um, where unfortunately I'm not the only freelancer. Many freelancers, you know, um, struggle with this because it's, you know, employers, media organizations don't want to hire freelancers in high risk areas. So, yes, I would definitely, you know, I would only go back to Ukraine if I had a contract with the media outlet. And I would recommend, um, I would actually, you know, urge freelancers not to go because I think it's too dangerous. And if you don't have um, that safety gear, that safety, you know, mechanism or that organization um, helping you with your security, I think it's too risky to do it on your own right now. Okay, thanks for explaining that. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions about uh, what you would recommend for, for freelancers. I'll get to those in a moment, Sarah. First, um, one question I see here from my coworker at Fox 13, Aaron Cox, is can you kind of compare and contrast what you saw in 2014 versus what you saw in 2022? That's a great question. So I wasn't um, directly, re I wasn't reporting from the front lines in 2014. I was, um, I only started reporting from the front lines late later on. But what I saw across the country in 2014, 2015, 2016, was also a massive displacement crisis. But um, what I would say um, the main difference was, was that at that point there was no fighting in Kiev, no fighting in Western Ukraine. And as soon as people would get out of the Donbass and get out of eastern Ukraine, they would um, they would feel safe. Um, uh, there were a lot of refugee centers, you know, for, 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 for I mean, I said refugees, but it's actually internally displaced persons centers in in Kiev. Um, you know, many people arrived all the way to western Ukraine, um, and there was a sense of you know, there is a safe shelter in Ukraine, you know, as long as you could get out of the Donbass of, of the East. And right now, I think there is, I think it's very difficult. I, I don't think there is a safe haven in Ukraine right now. People are fleeing across the border. And of course, at that time, that was, I mean, we've seen a lot of people flee toward Poland, you know, particularly Poland was one of the countries that received most Ukrainian refugees. But for example, um, you know, as a Slovak citizen, I, I know that it was very difficult for people to get to Slovakia, if not impossible at the time you needed, you know, the visa application and 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 everything. So um, unless people would go in and ask for asylum as war refugees, it was not possible. Whereas right now what you see is that, you know, people can receive temporary permits. So that's why there's so many refugees fleeing. And that's partly linked to the fact that there's no safe place in Ukraine right now. So the crisis kind of happening, you know, cross borders and the level of panic and also the severity and the, the you know, the, the, the fact that it happened so quickly kind of contributed to this massive, um, you know, migration crisis, the biggest one that we've seen since, since World War II. So that is kind of very new and very different. Okay, thanks, sir. Um, before I pose this next question, I'm going to ask if can uh, we shut off Sarah's uh, sharing on the screen so we can see her whole face now. I think we um, of everyone's seen that. Okay. 
All right. Um, thanks. Uh, so my, the next question we have here is actually from Avery Holt here in the communications department at the University of Utah. Holton, pardon me, Avery Holton. Um, and um, she wants to know how you got in touch with some of these journalist organizations in the first place. You, you gave thanks to the Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporters Without Borders. Were these organizations you were familiar with before uh, going into Ukraine in, in February, or um, did you kind of yes. find them on the fly, or how did that work? Yes, absolutely. I was familiar with, with all these organizations, and I had interviewed some of them for some journalism stories. I had contacted both Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporters Without Borders prior to going to Ukraine. If I wasn't going to Ukraine on a um, press trip with the UN, I wouldn't have gone there without a bulletproof vest. At one point, Reporters Without Borders actually offered to, uh, um, I, you know, I could have picked up a, a bulletproof vest from uh, Reporters Without Borders. In the end, I couldn't, couldn't have done it because I'm based in Slovakia and, and the bulletproof vest was, was in Paris. But it's definitely, you know, I think as a, as a foreign correspondent, especially as a freelancer, you need to have those contacts and, you know, and, and you need to get in touch with organizations like these before you go, or at least have their numbers and, you know, know of, uh, you know, which organizations provide assistance to freelancers in need. Because I think particularly without the committee to protect journalists, you know, maybe I, I wouldn't be here now because they essentially advised me um, to go to that hotel. They, they put me in touch with people. They were on the phone with me and they really helped me. So uh, I, you know, I, I survived thanks to the Committee to Protect Journalists. Okay, um, thanks for explaining that. Um, have another question here. Um, this is from Norm Schaff. Hope I'm pronouncing that right, Norm. Um, he's wondering, are, when do you recommend freelancers? not go into high risk areas in general or was your recommendation specific to ukraine right now well i mean i mean ukraine right now is very unpredictable i definitely wouldn't recommend freelancers to go there but i think you know the same can apply to other high risk areas if you go there um, you know, without um, a media organization, without a contract or without, you know, somebody else that can kind of help you with your security, um, it might be very challenging, especially in kind of fast moving environments like Ukraine, where you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and, you know, you might physically not be able to monitor the news if you want to be reporting or if you need, you know, to hide. And then so, uh, you know, any kind of hostile environments that keep on changing very quickly and you know where you can't speak the language where you, you can't make contingency plans i really wouldn't recommend to go there on your own because then you know you risk to go through what uh, i went through in ukraine and i wouldn't recommend that to anyone okay thanks for clarifying that um uh, here's one uh, Kim Mangum, uh, also at, in the comms department, posed. Um, and you talked about, you know, you didn't have a bulletproof jacket or helmet. Is this um, something you'd been issued by other organizations before? Or would you, is this something you recommend uh, every journalist going into a conflict zone purchase for themselves now and, and take with them? And, and what equipment did you have when you went into Ukraine? Right. So I definitely, uh, you know, wouldn't recommend anyone to go to a war zone without a bulletproof vest. And the only reason I was there without one was that, as I was saying, I was heading to a press trip uh, organized by the UN. And, you know, and, and I've done many press trips before with both the UN and humanitarian organizations. And they would always um, make sure that you have a bulletproof jacket, especially when you would visit, you know, locations that were kind of high risk because sometimes you don't need the bulletproof vest all the time, um, it, depending on where you go. I mean, uh, you know, in, in Ukraine right now, obviously if you're in Eastern Ukraine, I would kind of recommend wearing that most of the time, but sometimes you go to places where you can kind of take it off in your hotel, but then when you would go outside, you would put it on. Um, right now, I wouldn't recommend to going, going to Ukraine without one. Uh, you could get one from, you know, organizations that, um, 
you know, you can borrow it from organizations like Reporters Without Borders um, and, uh, you know, I think Rory Pick Trust and many other organizations that help reporters. If you are embedded with an NGO, you know, they should be able to uh, to make sure you have your safety kit. And as for my um, own equipment, um, I do have a hostile environments training that, again, you know, was one of the things that saved my life. And I wouldn't recommend going to a hostile zone without a training. Um, so, you know, I had my my grab bag and my safety kit and, you know, I, I, I had maps printed out and, you know, numbers, you know, written um, and I had all kinds of, you know, things that you might need in a war zone. And, and I was buying supplies constantly. And I think for every country, you need to make a plan and a contingency plan and make sure that you have, you know, everything that you might need for, in case something happens with you. And also that you don't rely, you know, on your devices um, in case there's no internet, for example. So, so I had a grab bag with basic equipment like this, but I did not have, you know, the, the bulletproof vest and, and, and helmet that uh, were the two things I needed the most, I think. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Um, let's see, I'm looking here at other questions. Um, uh, another one from Aaron Cox here at Fox 13, but um, you talked a few times about uh, being a citizen versus being a journalist. Um, what did you learn about yourself and your role as a journalist? Right. So this was the very, very difficult thing for me. And again, you know, I uh, even though I did have no, I didn't have a contract. So in, in a way, I, I was a citizen when I went to Ukraine. Um, as a freelancer in, you know, in normal experience, in normal, you know, um, circumstances, you would be able to pitch stories to outlets and, and then if they are interested or if they commission you, um, you know, or if you've agreed with someone on the fact that they would commission you, um, you know, I, I have a press card and I consider myself as a journalist. When the situation um, escalated in Ukraine so quickly and so dramatically, um, many newsrooms, just like Al Jazeera, kind of, um, you know, made sure that they would not work with freelancers because they could not guarantee their security. And so um, I kind of ended up in Kharkiv knowing that it would be very unlikely for me to find any other outlet to, to, to collaborate with or to freelance for in that moment because because of the fact that the place that, you know, where I found myself in was simply too dangerous. Um, and for me, you know, in, in those moments, it was very difficult because we know as freelance journalists covering um, hostile zones that these things happen. But in Ukraine, everything happened so quickly that it was really a lot to take on as a human being. And at one point, you know, I was just running to the underground shelter without um, without equipment, without a bulletproof vest, without a media organization. And I was just, and at one point when I was at the train station, I was alone. And this is what I was saying when I said, I was looking for people who kind of make, make friends with people so that I don't have to go through this horrendous experience, you know, of, of, of being in a shelter, of, of being in a city under, under siege on my own, because I knew no, I, I didn't know anyone in Kharkiv. Um, and I decided to use that experience to, maybe you know keep keep that with me and, and carry that with me that you know that feeling of, of just being alone in a war zone and being there as a civilian um to better understand the people that that i interview and i have to say I, i've done many many interviews with you know refugees throughout my journalism career and you know this is one of the things that you can understand but you never fully get it um, you know until you you've experienced it yourself so I've experienced a little bit of you know of what some of the refugees have been through and I think it gives me a better sense of empathy and connection with the people I I, I interview but I have to say that obviously compared to so many other citizens and you know compared to so many people I was just very very lucky because most citizens you know in Kharkiv could not just hop on, on a car and, and leave you know so I, I also have to be aware of that privilege that I have and now the question is how how do I use that privilege you know do I 
how do I use it? I should use it to tell stories of people or, um, you know, to become a better journalist, to have more empathy. And this is what I would kind of like to do. Um, but I have to, I also have to say that I'm so heartbroken for all the, you know, the citizens of Ukraine who cannot make it out right now because just witnessing this, you know, out, outbreak of the war was, was so awful. And I cannot even imagine what people in Kharkiv or Mariupol or other cities must be going through now. Okay, uh, that's actually a pretty good lead in to a question we have from Dawn Wright, who is an instructor at the University of Utah and teaches media writing. And uh, she is wondering, do you think younger generations value news enough and have enough reverence for the importance of journalism to appreciate the sacrifices that journalists take? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. But what I will say is that um, I've received a lot of messages from people, from friends, from communities, from followers on Twitter, on social media while I was there. And I do have to say that there's a lot of people who follow me on Twitter and that I don't know personally who have been very supportive and and kind of showed a lot of um you know, faith in my work and somebody actually sent me a message and said, please don't give up. This is this is your calling. And I was very grateful for that because I was losing hope myself in those moments. I think, you know, it's let's just be honest, like I, I was desperate, right? Um, so I have to say that I've received some some really genuine message of message messages of support. Um, but again, yes, I don't know if, you know, if younger generations value value this. And, it, you know, it's a real question, especially with the fact that, you know, everyone has, you know, iPhones and, and, and smartphones right now. So it's very easy for anyone to just, you know, shoot videos and post them online. But I think that journalism is more important now than ever. Okay. Um you know, we might just go ahead and end there. We got, um, it's just about one o'clock and that was kind of a nice uh, coda to leave on, uh, Sarah. So, um, Sean, if, uh, I think we've met our obligations here, haven't we? And uh, I kind of I kind of liked uh, how we ended there. So. Um, yeah, that was, that was great. Okay. Yeah, thank you to both of you. Thank you so much, Nate, for reaching out to us and for, um, getting this uh, set up with Sarah for us. And Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. That's an amazing story. And I know we have a lot of students on the, on the call right now. And so hopefully they are inspired um, by what they have heard here and they understand the, the stakes of what it means to really report the news in a, in a situation like this and how important um, the work is that uh, that you're doing and that so many other journalists are doing right now. I just want to let everyone know that um, the meeting was recorded, the presentation and the Q&A was recorded. Um, I will be getting that edited and posted up on the uh, Communication Institute uh, YouTube channel, hopefully sometime tomorrow, uh, midday or tomorrow afternoon. Um, so if you want to rewatch this or if you want to um, use it in your courses going forward, I know we have a couple of instructors on the call here or um, tweet it out, uh, post it on your uh, social media channels uh, for others to have the experience of uh, hearing what Sarah had to say. We would very much appreciate that as well. So Nate, Sarah, do you guys have anything more before we, before we end? Uh, I just have another thanks to you, Sean, and uh, the comms department and the uh, communications institute. And, and thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Okay. And COM 5850, if any students are looking for a capstone in the fall, that's the investigative reporting class I teach. I'll make one pitch for that. <laughs> there you go. Sign up for Nate's class. Okay. Well, thank you all. And everyone have a nice rest of your day and rest of your week.